I sometimes lose sight of the real Jesus. I often picture Jesus, the very son of God, as a well-spoken middle-class white guy. But this is so far from the truth. Just think about how his story begins. Every Christmas we reenact the nativity scene. The children really enjoy it. They dress up as animals or put towels on their heads and become shepherds. It's all so perfect. But we quickly forget what really took place. We forget that Jesus was a baby, born into rural poverty, under enemy occupation. We forget that Jesus would have been seen as an illegitimate child, born in less than ideal circumstances. And who comes to visit this new baby? It is definitely not the religious types or the political elite. It's a bunch of shepherds and some stargazers. Both of these groups of people were seen as sinners. Shepherds were poorly paid. They spent their time out in the hills looking after the sheep. They had to work seven days a week and were unable to keep the Sabbath. This was seen as a sin. And the wise men, as we often call them, are Gentiles. They are foreigners. They are not part of God's people. What a random welcoming party. What an imperfect start. And then, soon after his birth, King Herod wants this new King of the Jews dead. And so he calls for the killing of all baby boys under the age of two. This is a bloody, violent time in history. Mary and Joseph are forced to flee with their newborn to Egypt. And so Jesus becomes an asylum-seeking refugee. Eventually, they come back to Israel and Jesus grows up in Nazareth. Now, Nazareth has a certain reputation. It was Loserville. Can anything good come from Nazareth, people asked. Nazareth was the ghetto. And yet Jesus calls the ghetto home. He was poor, suffering under political occupation. He was in need of asylum. He was seen as illegitimate. This Jesus is so different from the plastic one that we create. He was not born into power or status. He was not born with luxury and wealth. He was born in the wrong corner of the wrong land at the wrong time. Jesus was an underdog. And that one simple fact changes everything about how we see ourselves. Jesus didn't change history in the way you might expect. There were no armies or wars, just the gathering of outcasts, a gathering of underdogs. The story of Jesus and his disciples begins much earlier by a lake, a big lake. Now this lake is so big that the locals call it the sea, the Sea of Galilee. Now this area was a very fertile area, it was densely populated. And this meant that there were many pagan nations nearby. And lots of their rituals had been adopted by the Jewish people. So Jesus comes to an area where it is both morally and spiritually questionable. Jesus comes to the underdogs. By this lake are two men, Peter and Andrew. They throw their nets out into the sea. They are simple fishermen. And one day their normality is interrupted. When Jesus enters their story, he turns their world upside down with these three simple words. Come, follow me. What's amazing about this is that Jesus chooses them. He chooses ordinary fishermen from a dubious part of Israel. There's no formal interview. 
It's just a simple call. Come, follow me. And they do just that. They leave their home. They leave their family. They leave their profession. And they embark on this journey with Jesus. And as I read this story, I always wonder, why did Jesus choose ordinary fishermen? Perhaps it was because they were bold and adventurous. But if you're going to try and start a movement that will have a global impact, then surely you want people with a good education, people with some spare cash, people from the right part of town. Surely you want people of influence and experience. You don't want underdogs, do you? I think that the choice of disciples that Jesus makes shows us something fresh about who Jesus is. See, on paper, these guys are just fishermen, but Jesus sees their potential. For Jesus, the most important thing is not our ability, it is our availability. And the question is, are you making yourself available to God? Stories are best when there are twists and turns. And Peter's life story is full of them. He begins this journey of following Jesus. And there are certain times when he gets it so right, when he knows that Jesus is the Son of God, when he dares to walk out on water towards Jesus, when he asks questions and isn't afraid to learn. But there are also times when he gets it so wrong, like the time when he tries to talk Jesus out of going to the cross. The time when he takes his sword out and swipes off a man's ear. The time when he doesn't understand that Jesus needs to serve him. Imagine what it must have been like for the fisherman Peter on that night when Jesus has been arrested. There he is in the courtyard. He could probably hear the religious leaders mocking Jesus. He could probably hear the sound of Jesus being beaten. Perhaps he could even hear the wretched groans that Jesus was making. Everybody else has fled, but Peter has followed at a distance. A fire in the corner lights up his face. Then a slave girl walks up to Peter. She looks at him closely and says, you know this man. Peter denies it quickly and moves to a different area of the courtyard. Then a different slave girl walks up to him, pointing him out to the crowd and saying, this man was one of his friends. I do not know this man, says Peter. Then, for a third time, an entire crowd come towards Peter. Surely you know this man. You're from Galilee. I swear I do not know this man. And then, then the cockerel crows. Betrayal is hard to forgive. Peter wasn't just an ordinary fisherman. He was an ordinary failure. He had let Jesus down at the most critical point of his ministry. But the story doesn't end there. After Jesus has died and risen again, we go back to this big lake, back to the Sea of Galilee, back to where the story began. And it's there that we see one of the most amazing stories of reconciliation in human history. Peter has returned home to a world that is familiar to him. He has returned to what he knows best, fishing. And there on the beach with a barbecue is Jesus. The moment Peter realizes that it's Jesus, he heads to shore as fast as he can. And there, sat on the rocks, over breakfast, Jesus asks, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? 
Do you love me? We jump just a few weeks forward. Jesus has ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit comes and rests on the disciples and they pour out of the upper room into the streets just round the corner from where Peter has denied Jesus three times. And there, on the day of Pentecost, who gets up to preach? It's Peter. And he nails it. 3,000 people join the Jesus movement in one day. I find it so comforting that Jesus calls the underdogs. He doesn't look at your qualifications. He doesn't check your bank balance. He doesn't care about your influence. Why? Because he doesn't see you the same way the world sees you. He calls you for who you are. We all feel like underdogs sometimes. We can't change the world by ourselves. When we mess up and feel like giving up, Jesus forgives us and he won't give up on us. He calls the underdogs, the ordinary people and the failures to have a relationship with him. Jesus even leaves the life-changing good news in the hands of the underdogs with a call to reach all nations. Why did Jesus call the underdogs? Because that's precisely what he was. Born into poverty on the wrong side of town, he was not what the Jews had expected in a savior. But how do his humble beginnings affect us? The truth is that God chose to come to earth as an underdog. It was a deliberate act not a random outcome or insignificant detail. God chose to be poor, to be vulnerable, to be cloaked in ordinary flesh and blood, because that's what he does. God chose to become the underdog, and he chooses the underdogs even today. He chooses us not because of our own qualifications or greatness, but because of his own. Remembering that Jesus was an underdog helps us ultimately know our place, not as leaders, but as followers, not as masters, but as servants, trusting God's goodness not our own ability. Are you prepared to be led by an underdog? Are you willing to see others as Jesus sees them? Are you ready to trust God completely? You must have seen those paintings of Jesus with long flowing blonde hair, with blue eyes and soft skin, and that serene look on the face of the Son of God. They're all, well, nice. But sometimes I think our idea of who Jesus is has become quite twisted. And here's the thing, they're not just bad art, they're toxic for the heart. These pictures can distort our understanding of Jesus, and that is dangerous. In the last century, there were over 230 different revolutions, 
Many of them were bloody and violent revolutions as new political parties came to power. There have also been cultural revolutions that have changed the way we think. But whatever the type of revolution, no matter what the cause is, they always involve sudden and drastic change that impacts the very course of history. Nobody has ever altered the course of history quite like Jesus. Jesus was a revolutionary. His life was the ultimate revolution. The change that he brought was sudden and dramatic, and it's still altering the course of history today. Jesus wasn't blonde-haired and blue-eyed, and he wasn't just a really nice guy. He turned over tables in the temple. He challenged the religious establishment. He crossed racial divides. He purposefully and publicly broke religious laws. And then, tortured to death on the cross, Jesus was the ultimate revolutionary. He gave up his life for others. What is different about Jesus is that his revolution was not just about dealing with political systems or affecting cultural change. He came to deal with the very source of the issue, the human heart. Jesus didn't hide the fact that he was on earth to bring about change. He spends that time in the wilderness fasting, and then he comes back to Nazareth, his hometown. And there he goes into the synagogue, and he's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolls the scroll and reads these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and proclaim freedom for the prisoners and sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolls up the scroll. He gives it back to the attendant and he sits down. All of the eyes in the synagogue are upon him as he says these words. Today, in your hearing, this scripture has been fulfilled. It's one of those moments, a defining point, a line in the sand that marks the past from the present. Things can never be the same again. Let's just recap on those words. Good news for the poor, freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind, release for the oppressed. Jesus is saying that those who are seen as outsiders by society are first in line for a touch from God. Powerful words. But do we understand that they are about us? None of us have to be outsiders anymore. How often do we just take the gospel for granted? How often do we think about it as some old account of things that happened in a distant time among a distant people? And yet because God became flesh, we have good news. We have freedom. We have sight. And we have been released. Because of this revolutionary change, our lives should never be the same again. That means that your life should never be the same again. Now the year of the Lord's favour was an Old Testament concept. We find it in the book of Leviticus. The concept was this, that every 50 years, all slaves would be freed. All land that had been bought would be returned to the original owner. All debts would be cancelled. The idea was that nobody would ever be in poverty. Everything would go back to the way it had been before. The thing is, this whole custom had probably never actually been put into practice. But here, in the synagogue, with all eyes transfixed upon Jesus, 
he says the following words. Today, in your hearing, this scripture has been fulfilled. The Jewish people had expected these prophetic words to become reality once they had been set free from captivity in Babylon. But they had been disappointed. Things hadn't worked out the way they had hoped. The revolution hadn't come as they had planned. But Jesus knew that through his life, his death and his resurrection, that these prophetic words would be fulfilled. These words that Jesus spoke about the scripture being fulfilled are nothing short of a revolutionary manifesto, a revolution of freedom. If this is the manifesto of Jesus, then it makes sense that it also becomes our manifesto. We are called to be revolutionaries, revolutionaries who bring freedom. But this is a different kind of revolution. There's no violence, no guns. This is a revolution of love. As Jesus reads from Isaiah, he stops one line short of the following words, to proclaim the day of the Lord's vengeance. He stops short on purpose. See, he has come not to show God's vengeance and God's wrath. He has come to demonstrate God's love. Jesus taught, love your enemies. But he didn't just teach it, he lived it as well. There's that great story when Jesus is about to be arrested. The temple guard comes to collect him and Peter chops off one of their ears. Jesus heals the guard's ear. This is incredible. The man who's come to capture Jesus is the one that receives healing. This is love. Now, this kind of love is beyond most of us. Think back over the past few days. I'm sure that somebody has done something to annoy you. Maybe they were right, maybe they were wrong. But it seems like every day we can struggle to consistently treat people the way that we should. But Jesus makes it possible. He begins this whole phrase by saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. It was the spirit of God who anointed Jesus. And it's that same spirit who works with us, in us and through us today. The Spirit of God is not given to us just that we have a nice warm fuzzy feeling. The Spirit of God enables the revolution. The Spirit of God empowers us to love even those who persecute us. Revolutions are costly. Whilst Jesus is in the synagogue, he begins to tell the people how sometimes God chooses to bless the Gentiles. Now this message is controversial, and the people get so angry they take Jesus to the edge of a cliff and try to push him off. Jesus always demonstrates love, but his message is controversial. At times, people push him away, but at other times, they even try and kill him. It is fitting that towards the end of Jesus' life, Barabbas, a violent man staging a revolution against Rome, is freed. While Jesus, a loving man, staging a revolution against all the powers of evil, is nailed to a cross. Jesus pays the ultimate revolutionary price. So hear this again, revolutions are often costly. What will you pay for this revolution of freedom? What will you invest that the good news might go to the poor, that the prisoners may be set free, that the blind may see, that the oppressed may be released? One day you and I will both die. The question is this, Will we die as spectators or will we die 
as revolutionaries. They say every child needs a hero. And it's pretty much the same as we get older too. We like to watch as injustice gets dealt with, evil gets fought, and the world gets put right again. But of all the heroes we've ever seen, there is one who towers above the rest. He overpowers injustice, defeats evil, and transforms the world. His name is Jesus. He's the greatest hero we can ever hope to follow. Jesus, our hero, is unique. He's not like other heroes. His greatest act appears to be a horrendous defeat, summed up by one simple line in the Bible. And Jesus was crucified. That phrase has become so familiar. Those four words have been used so much that they've been rinsed of their horror and pain. But when we read the Gospels, we get the full story. It unfolds painfully, slowly, graphically. The writers want to remind us of the bloody reality, of the shocking abuse that Jesus receives. And they pack the scenes with raw, agonizing detail. Like the point when Pontius Pilate brings Jesus out to the crowd, wearing a purple robe, a crown of thorns biting through skin and tissue into his skull. Here is the man, Pilate says. The sound of the crowd shouting, nail him to a cross, nail him to a cross. Pontius Pilate washing his hands as Jesus, a mess of congealed blood and open wounds, stands by. It's time we followed Jesus and got to know him better. It's time we thought again about how this hero can change our lives. Why? Because there's a danger that we can lose sight of the truth. The greatest event in history can become just words in a story. And in that story, as he hangs, suffocating on a cross, Jesus doesn't appear to be very much of a hero. It's in these passages we get some of the greatest insights into who Jesus is. Jesus, who is there at the creation of the universe, becomes one of us and is brutally, callously killed. As this happens, Matthew records these physical ramifications. The sky goes black. The temple curtain is torn in two. An earthquake shakes the very foundations of Jerusalem. And graves break open and dead people come back to life. This is more than the death of a mere man. The whole of creation seems to react to what is going on. Something is happening on a cosmic level. And these four physical symbols show us something of a deeper spiritual reality, which the death of Jesus alters.
Think about the sky turning black. It happens just as Jesus shouts those words, My God! My God! Why have you forsaken me? As the last breath leaves his body, the light goes out. Think about this first symbol. Now, it's not evening, it's midday. And for three hours, from midday till three o'clock, the sky goes dark. As Jesus breathes his last, there is darkness. Jesus is often known as the light of the world. And yet in this moment, as Jesus takes upon him the sin of the world, as Jesus dies, the world goes dark. The light of the world is extinguished. For the disciples of Jesus, it wasn't just three hours, but three days of darkness. Three days of confusion and questioning. But even in this moment of darkness, there remains a glimmer of hope. See, as Jesus says those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's in fact quoting a Psalm that King David wrote many years earlier. The Psalm we know today as Psalm 22. And people back then, they knew their Psalms. It would have made the connection. It would be like if I sang the first line of a famous song today. People would understand the reference. They may even sing with me. And the beautiful thing about Psalm 22 is that although it begins with such desperation, those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is that it actually ends with a real sense of hope. It ends with the idea of every knee bowing before God. One day, despite this present darkness, salvation will come. There on that cross, in the middle of all of that darkness, something beautiful was happening. Jesus the hero was defeating darkness. Do we realise that ultimately, the battle against evil has been won? The second symbol brings us to the Jewish temple. The temple had many different areas. One of the most significant areas was called the Holy of Holies. It was in the Holy of Holies that once a year the high priest would enter on the Day of Atonement. And there he would make a blood sacrifice for the people's sins. The Holy of Holies was separated from where the priests normally worked by a huge curtain, almost nine times my height. And as Jesus dies, this huge curtain, which acts like a wall or a shield, is torn in two. Is this the work of a hero? Now there's a really important detail here. This massive curtain is torn from top to bottom. It wasn't done by man from the bottom, but done by God from the top. It was not man's action, it was God's action. This symbol communicates so much. God is not only accessible in a temple. God is not only accessible in ritual. God is not only accessible to a chosen few. The temple curtain has been torn. Access has been granted. Nothing can ever be the same again. Do we realize the gift that we have in being able to speak directly to the Creator God. We are often so focused on living in the now that we forget that one day Jesus will return. We forget to live in that reality. Perhaps it's because it's so hard for us to get our heads around. But as Jesus breathes his last, 
the earth starts shaking, rocks start splitting apart. Now the death of Jesus doesn't just impact humanity, or the sky, or a temple curtain, it impacts the very earth itself. See, creation is sick. It is because of our selfishness that creation can no longer fully reflect the glory of God. Paul writes in Romans about creation groaning as it waits to be set free. One day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. One day everything will be put right. A new age is breaking in. The earthquake symbolises this new age breaking in. The earth shaking symbolises the whole of life being shaken up. The hero's plan to change everything is set in motion. And one day, Jesus will return. But right now, the baton is in our hands. The countdown has started. But do we realise that the plan is in motion? That the clock is ticking? The death of our hero means that all darkness has been defeated, that we can all have access to God, and we are all invited to take part in the hero's story. So how does this change the way we live our lives? Sudden darkness for three hours. The temple curtain being torn from top to bottom. Rocks splitting, the earth shaking. And here's the fourth and final sign. Graves burst open and dead people begin to walk. Now there's been lots of debate as to whether graves actually burst open and dead people began to walk. Some theologians believe this is absolutely true. Others argue that Matthew is writing about something in the future when one day Jesus will return. But either way, there's a really important message here. See, Jesus not only died, but three days later, he did burst out of the grave. He rose triumphant. Jesus, our hero, defeated death. Jesus has not only defeated death himself, but he has beaten death for all who put their faith in him. Death has been conquered. Do we realise that we really have nothing to fear about dying? As women weep and as soldiers mock, Jesus hangs there on a cross. He doesn't appear to be much of a hero. But then, as Jesus breathes his last, the eternal Son of God dies. The light goes out. God breaks out of man's box. And the very earth we walk on shakes and breaks. And at that point, a Roman centurion says, Surely this was God's Son. Like the disciples faced with the resurrected Jesus, we have nothing to fear. We're invited to speak directly to God. Every one of us has a role to play, and even death isn't final. Has there ever been such a hero as Jesus?
Many of us call ourselves Christians. We claim to be followers of Jesus. But do we really know who we are following? You see, it's very easy to follow a list of rules or to follow what we think the church expects of us. But we're called to follow a person. And that is very different altogether. Especially when that person is Jesus. His footprints have long since left the land. We can't see him anymore. So how can we follow him? Maybe we shouldn't be asking how do we follow Jesus, but who is the Jesus that we're called to follow? And what would your answer be? Is Jesus your headliner, the focus of your existence, the source of your life? Or is he someone you follow only when he's going the way that suits you? Jesus is with his followers in Caesarea Philippi. This place is full of altars and idols. It's a place full of chaos. People worshipping different things, but not worshipping the one true God. This place is a mess. It needs cleaning up. And Jesus says to his followers, who do you say I am? And Peter responds, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. In this statement, Peter realizes that Jesus is the promised rescuer that the Jewish people are waiting for. He understands that Jesus is a fulfillment of the prophecies. He understands something of the true identity of Jesus. And as he makes his public confession, he gets it. There, amongst the altars and the idols, amongst the hope and the hype of this town, Peter gets it. He knows who Jesus is. Well, kind of. He thinks he gets it. Six days later, Jesus leads Peter, James and John on a journey. They climb a mountain. I imagine it was quite a high mountain. It must have been hard work scaling to the top, talking and sharing. And then, as they begin to reach the top, something happens. Suddenly, the face of Jesus begins to shine so bright. It begins to shine like the sun. And then his cloak, his cloak becomes as white as light, shining bright for all to follow. Can you imagine this? You've been traveling with this guy for a few years and suddenly, he becomes this burst of light. This is not normal. This is supernatural. And it doesn't end there. Moses and Elijah, two guys who've been gone for centuries, appear on this mountaintop. This thing gets even stranger. And there's more. Suddenly this cloud envelops them and this booming voice from heaven says, this is my son whom I love. Can you begin to imagine what this must have been like? Peter, James and John can't cope. They fall to their faces terrified. And if that was me, I think I would have done the same as well. With that one question pumping through my head, who is this man? Of the many ways that we fail Jesus, one of the most common is this. We forget who he really is. We forget that he's the son of God, the one who existed before the beginning of time. Instead, 
we sometimes treat following him like a hobby or a game that we play, rather than the reason that we live. We make him small enough to fit around our own lives, and we couldn't get it more wrong. See, this is Jesus. Jesus in his glory, in his splendor, in his radiance, in his power. Is this the Jesus you follow? Have you ever wondered why it was Moses and Elijah on that mountaintop? Why not Abraham or David or Noah? Why these two individuals? Why Moses and Elijah? Stories are powerful things. The disciples would have understood and known the stories of Moses and Elijah. See, each year, as the disciples celebrated the Passover feast, they would hear the stories of the great leader, Moses. Moses, who had rescued his people from Egypt through the Red Sea. It was Moses who had ascended Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments directly from God. And it was these laws that had formed the very basis for how the people lived at the time of Jesus. But Jesus made all those laws fall into place. He made sense of all of them. Elijah had his own adventures. He was known as the greatest prophet. He too did miraculous things. He had taken on the prophets of Baal in a fire-making contest on top of Mount Carmel. And then he never actually died. He got whisked away in a whirlwind as chariots of fire and horses of fire came down from heaven and swooped him up. See, Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. In this moment, on this mountaintop, Jesus brings together the threads of human history. Jesus comes not to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Jesus pulls the stories together. This moment isn't just about the past, but it's also about the future. See, Jesus has brought Peter, James and John to this mountaintop. And there's no mistake here. He's brought them here because they are the beginning of the church, the future story that unfolds from this point. The story of the church continues today, and we are part of it. Jesus stands in the middle of everything that has gone and everything that will be. He is the center point of human history. Jesus is the headliner in the story of God's relationship with humanity. It is in Jesus that everything begins to make sense. Is this the Jesus you are following? Do you follow Jesus in his centrality, in his timelessness, in his significance? Is this the Jesus that you follow? Or do you follow another version, a weaker one, watered down, cleaned up or locked away? One who you can ignore when you want to, who fits in with your plans, who follows your lead. You see, if you truly believe that Jesus is the headliner, then how is your life story being shaped as you follow him? What I love about this passage isn't just the greatness of Jesus, but it's what happens next. Peter, James and John are sprawled out on the floor, shaking with fear. 
And what does Jesus do? He walks straight up to them. He gets down and he touches them. He touches them. And then he says these words, do not be afraid. He speaks directly into their insecurity. He knows their needs and he loves them. Six days earlier, Peter had got it so right when he declared that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. But it's in this experience that I think Peter gets a fresh insight into exactly what that means. He had the words, but it's in this moment, on this mountaintop, as his face is there pressed against the floor, that he realises who Jesus really is. But still, Peter hasn't got everything right. He says to Jesus, let's build three shelters, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. You see, this was a Jewish custom. The idea was to build altars on high places where people had experienced God. But Peter has it all wrong. Jesus doesn't want memorials on a mountaintop. Jesus wants relationship. He wants us to follow after him. We are not called to follow lists of rules and regulations. We're called to follow the very person of Jesus. Wow. And it is as we fall on our face in the dirt, recognising that he is the headliner, that we also discover that he lovingly speaks directly into our fragile lives. Jesus is unlike any other headliner we could follow. He is worthy of surrendering everything we have to follow him. The disciples did not get everything right, but they knew this about the Jesus they were following, that he forgave them, that he loved them, that he was to be trusted, and that he was to be obeyed. Is that the way you follow Jesus? We all have dreams. Some of us dream about becoming rich or about being successful or finding the right partner. Other people dream bigger dreams about how we can change the world, how we can shape society, how we can fight injustice. Many of us have these bigger dreams, but we dare not dream them. We ask, well, what if I can't achieve this? What if people laugh at me? What if these things aren't really possible? We even use the word dreamer as a put down. But Jesus was a dreamer. He believed another world was possible. He believed in a dream that he was willing to pay for with his life. And this dream has inspired generations of believers and non-believers alike. William Wilberforce in his battle against slavery, Gandhi in his fight against British imperialism, Martin Luther King as he fought for racial equality, Mother Teresa as she fought against poverty. All of these people have been inspired by the dream of Jesus. Jesus' dream wasn't a fantasy. 
It's a dream for how the world should be. If you wake up to this dream, it can change everything. One day, Jesus climbs a large hill. He's being followed by a whole group of people who want to hear more about the dreams that he has. He reaches the top of the hill and then he begins to preach the most amazing stuff. The people are captivated. He talks about everything from, from sex and lust to greed and money. Three and a half thousand years earlier, a different man had gone up a different mountain. Moses had climbed Mount Sinai and there he had received directly from God the Ten Commandments. This was to form a basis for the Jewish people, for their law systems. This was God's dream for the people of Israel. Now, on this day, on this different hilltop, was Jesus. He doesn't give commandments and laws, but he gives a new dream, a new way of living life in a new kingdom. This sermon, spoken almost 2,000 years ago, speaks directly into our context today. This dream is about what it means to live life well. This dream is about bringing light to the world. It's about bringing flavour to the world. This dream is a dream for us today. And at the heart of it all, there are three things that could change everything for you and for me. And so the dream of a new kingdom begins as Jesus talks about blessings. And who are blessed? It's not the rich or the powerful or the aggressive. This is an upside down kingdom. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn and grieve. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger for justice and mercy and peace and purity. These people will be blessed. But what does it really mean to be blessed? It means that God meets us with a deep sense of joy, that he comforts us, that he invests into us, that we become heirs to the kingdom of heaven, that we are shown mercy, that we become his sons and his daughters, and that one day we will see God. <laughs> the final blessed is this. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of me. Now, we've all heard stories of people who have been persecuted for their faith. We hear these stories and they fill us with a sense of dread. But Jesus says they are blessed. He says that even as their bodies suffer, God will give them joy. So often we think that joy comes from owning certain things, like the new gadget or a new car or a new pair of jeans, or from certain experiences like the dream holiday or the perfect partner. But Jesus is claiming that these kind of dreams never fully satisfy. So there's a piece of logic missing here. You want the truth? Jesus says that blessing comes ultimately in knowing God. Even amongst difficult circumstances, we can know God's joy. This is what it is to be blessed. This is where real joy is found. Have you discovered this kind of joy? Throughout this sermon on the hillside, 
Jesus talks about love. Love that overflows in caring for the poor, in building others up, in real commitment. Jesus says in the middle of this talk, you have heard it said, love your neighbour and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now what I find fascinating about this phrase is that in the Old Testament we discover this command, love your neighbour. And it defines neighbour in the widest sense of the term. But the scribes at the time couldn't deal with this, so they added a second part to the phrase, and hate your enemies. And I can understand this. I mean, who can really love their enemies? And yet Jesus urges us to love our enemies. This smacks against the logic of the world. How do you love those who despise you, who put you down and who hurt you? What does that kind of love even look like? The other thing that I find fascinating about this phrase is the word that Jesus uses for love, the word agape. He is not talking about a sexual love. He's not talking about love for a family member. He's not talking about love for a friend. He is talking about this agape love, which is giving and unlimited. It's the kind of love that springs from the donor rather than the worth of the individual. This is a love that can love your enemies. So to those who hate and scheme and try and bring others down, Jesus says, love others. You see, this kingdom is not about conquering our enemies. It's about loving our enemies. How are you demonstrating this kind of love? Time and time again in this teaching, there is a call to be humble. You see, it's very easy to do the right thing when all eyes are upon you, when a round of applause awaits you. But Jesus calls us to be humble. He calls us to make the story about him, not about ourselves. He challenges those who pray in such a way to try and look good. He challenges those who fast in such a way to try and look holy. He challenges those who give in such a way to try and create a public spectacle. Jesus challenges us to be humble. When you give to the poor, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Don't judge, else you too will be judged. And then Jesus taught his friends to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, forgive us our sins. We remind ourselves that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And we remind ourselves that we are dependent upon the grace of God in a world that is often divided by selfishness and arrogance. Jesus says, be humble. Are you really living a life of humility? So the dream of Jesus is built on joy, love and humility. All fine words. But Jesus doesn't just ask us to respond to his words. He asks us to respond to himself. Why? Because he put his dream into perfect action. See, as he's speaking, time and time again he says, I tell you, I tell you. I tell you. Now the prophets would always say things like, the Lord says. Other rabbis would say things like, I once heard a saying that goes like this. But Jesus had the audacity to say, I tell you. It's no wonder that the people were amazed with the authority with which he spoke. 
But Jesus did more than just preach. The dream of Jesus was more than mere words. He backed up all of these words with his actions, ultimately by dying on the cross and rising again. Therefore, we can trust the words that he spoke. And by putting his words into action, we begin to live life beautifully. Just think about it. Being joyful helps us battle against bitterness and show hope. Being loving helps us fight against injustice and show grace. Being humble helps us battle against selfishness and speak truth. So what about you? Are you able to be joyful in all circumstances? Are you able to love even your enemies? Are you able to put others first? This is the dream of Jesus for you. Will you let these words of Jesus become reality in your life as you draw closer to the ultimate dreamer? If we truly want to live our lives well, if we want to be joyful, loving, humble people, then we must respond to more than the words of Jesus. We must respond to the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. We must let our dreams be filled by his. The dream is becoming a reality. It begins with Jesus, the dreamer. All of our lives have key defining moments. In the life of Jesus, there is this beautiful defining moment as he comes to the River Jordan to meet with John the Baptist. Now, John is this crazy hippie type. He wears clothes made out of camel hair and he eats locusts. And he spends his time out in the desert, inviting the people of Israel to come and be baptized as they hear a message of repentance. And Jesus asks John to baptize him. They wade into the Jordan. John takes Jesus and pushes him under the water. And then, as Jesus breaks through the surface of the river, something incredible happens. The sky opens up. The Spirit of God appears like a dove. And there is this voice from heaven which declares, This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. Talk about defining moments. The following line of scripture says, The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness so that the devil could tempt him. Now this seems crazy. This seems nonsensical. This doesn't sound like a good game plan. Jesus has just been publicly recognized as the Son of God, and then he goes into hiding. Not just hiding, but 40 days of fasting. 40 days and nights, a whole chunk of time, in the wilderness with no food. Sometimes we expect following Jesus to be comfortable. But if Jesus is our example, and if Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights fasting in the desert after that amazing God experience, then perhaps we should realize that following Jesus will not always be comfortable. Following Jesus won't always be sensible in the eyes of the world, and it certainly won't always be predictable and safe. Many of us will happily stay in the familiarity of the River Jordan, 
but a few of us will trek into the wilderness. Yet Jesus lived out this crazy adventure, following wherever the Spirit of God led him. Jesus is a wild man. So from the beauty and tranquility of the baptism comes this sudden shift to this time of temptation in the wilderness. It's hard to imagine being alone for all that time. The quietness of your own thoughts. It's hard to imagine the hunger pains, that simple need for food. And if all that is hard to imagine, then try this. In this desperate time of need, Satan appears. The bell rings. Round one begins. Satan delivers his first blow. If you are God's son, then turn these stones into bread. Now for Jesus, this is all possible. Of course it is. He's already turned water into wine. And in the months ahead, he'll, he'll feed thousands of people with just a couple of loaves and a few fish. Jesus is the miracle worker. Turning stones into bread is easy. See, the temptation doesn't lie in the miracle. The temptation lies in the timing. Jesus is in the desert to fast, not to feast. He's purposely given up food so that he can know more of God's will. Though his body was desperately craving food, he doesn't go through the miracle. There's another story set hundreds of years earlier. A group of people have been set free from captivity and they find themselves in the desert and they are hungry and they begin to moan. Then God did the miraculous. Food came from heaven. The following morning, the floor was littered with bread. They were told to take just enough for that day. They were disobedient. They took more than they could possibly manage and stored it away. But where the Israelites fail, Jesus succeeds. He says to Satan, man cannot live by bread alone, but by the word of God. He blocks the first attack from Satan. There is something really challenging in this for me. See, there are certain things that I'm tempted to do that I know are just plain wrong. But there are other things, good things, things that we enjoy that in the wrong context or at the wrong time can corrupt us. The temptation to feast when we're called to fast. The temptation to keep when we're called to share. There are times when we are called to say no to things that appear very good. In the eyes of the world, this can seem wild. Jesus wins round one, but Satan has not given up. Round two commences as Satan takes Jesus to the highest point of the temple. And he says, if you are God's son, jump off. I imagine Jesus standing right up to Satan as he spits back. Scripture also says, don't test God. I find this fascinating, that Satan uses scripture to battle against Jesus. He quotes God's promise that God will save him, that his angels will catch him. He pulls these words out of context and distorts their meaning to set his trap. It shows us how important it is to understand what the text is really getting at. We have to understand the importance of getting the whole picture. It's by the Holy Spirit that through scripture we understand who we are and who we are called to be. Both of these temptations begin with a direct attack on the very identity of Jesus. They begin with those words, if you are God's son. That word if cuts pretty deep. But Jesus is able to duel Satan 
because he knows his very identity. He's able to battle evil, to stand up for what is good, to fight injustice because he knows who he is. There is no if in his mind. Knowing his identity allows him to be wild in the eyes of the world. It's not wrong to be tempted. We will always be tempted. Every day we will face inappropriate desires. What's wrong is when we give in to these inappropriate desires. When our thoughts and our actions go against God's best plan for us. But the more we fully understand our identity, when we understand how God sees us, that he loves us, it becomes easier to stand up against temptation. So the questions are these. How well do we really know who we are? How well do we know that God loves us? How well do we know that we are children of God? How well do we know that we are called to reflect the goodness and the beauty and the grace and the truth of God? How well do we know our real identity? It's when we really know who we are that we can live the way we are meant to live. Our lives won't always make sense to others, especially those who have lost their identity. But whoever said that God calls us to fit in, that he wants us to be just like everybody else, the very thought of this should make us sick. Round three kicks off as Satan brings Jesus to the top of a very high mountain. They look out and see all the nations of the world. Satan says, all of this will be yours if you bow down and worship me. The focus for attack has changed. Rather than attacking the very identity of Jesus, Satan begins to attack the plan that Jesus has, the mission that he has been sent to fulfill. See, for Jesus, he's been sent to reach every nation, every single tribe in the whole world. This is his mission. And yet Satan offers him a shortcut. We often look for shortcuts, for ways to cheat, the quick way to become rich, the quick way to lose weight, the quick way to become successful. The same is often true of our spiritual lives, the quick way to know more of God, the quick way to live a fruitful life. In this moment, Jesus is offered the ultimate shortcut. No cross, no pain, no suffering. All he has to do is bow down and worship Satan. His response? Leave Satan. Worship only the Lord your God. The duel concludes, at least for now. What would have happened if Jesus had bowed down to Satan? Perhaps they would have given him political authority over many different nations, but that's all he really had to offer. Ultimately, Jesus did not come for political authority or for wealth and influence. He came for a relationship with each and every one of us. He came that we might know our true identity. It seems foolish, it seems wild, and it is. In a strangely tame and predictable world, Jesus is wild and unpredictable. To begin to understand what he's talking about and what he does, we must understand his true identity, that he is the Son of God. Life is a strange mosaic of different experiences that mould us and shape us. But it's only God who sees the bigger picture, only God who can truly give us the perspective we need. It's only God who can show us who we truly are and send us out to live the wild life he intended. There are times in life when we are by the River Jordan, when things are good, we know our true identity is we know God loves us. 
But there are also times when we are led into the wilderness, into the fray. In these times, as we face temptation, we must hold tightly to our very identity, that we are the children of God, that we are citizens of another world, that in a conforming culture, we are called to be wild and dangerous followers of Jesus. And so the story begins with a moment, a moment in a garden, a moment as a choice is made. And in this moment, things change. A cosmic battle commences. God versus Satan. Good versus evil. Angels versus demons. Life versus death, light versus darkness. And as the story continues, there are kings and prophets, there are floods and wars, there are conspiracies and murder, there are empires and kingdoms. And then, then there comes another moment, another garden, another choice. Every day we are faced with decisions. Some we make without a second thought. Others take more time, they're more complex. Often the hardest choices to make are those with the greatest consequences. A few hours before this moment in this garden, Jesus is celebrating the Passover feast with his closest friends. They finish eating and they leave Jerusalem, probably singing songs as was their custom, songs about God's faithfulness. They head down the steep banks of the Kidron Valley, up towards the Mount of Olives, and they get to a certain place called Gethsemane, and there they stop. Now Jesus knew this place well, but this time it was different. It was night, it was quiet, and a choice had to be made. As Jesus enters the garden, his whole demeanor changes. He is full of sorrow, and the weight of the choice he is about to make becomes visible on his face. We often think of Jesus as victorious, as bold and strong, able to overcome even death itself. But in this moment, we discover a different side of Jesus. The man who struggles, who is pained. Jesus, the wrestler. And the choice that he's wrestling with is this, whether or not to go to the cross. We often take for granted what Jesus did on the cross. But here, in this moment, in this garden, in this man, the whole of human history rests. Jesus leaves many of his disciples on the very edge of the garden 
and he ventures in deeper with Peter, James and John, his closest friends. To them he says, please wait here, but don't fall into temptation. Pray for me. And then Jesus says these words, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. These are powerful words. Overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I mean, how does that feel? I can hardly even begin to imagine. And then he walks a short distance away, a stone's throw away. He needs to be alone. This is a decision that only he can make. He then falls on his knees and prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. In this moment of anguish, as he faces the reality of death, he still calls God Father. He still understands that his Father in heaven loves him. How often when times are tough, when difficult choices must be made, do we remember our Father in heaven? Take this cup from me, Jesus says. Now the cup here is significant. It symbolizes the suffering that he must endure and echoes the cup that Jesus held earlier that evening as they remembered the horror of death the night God's people were freed. Death is close and Jesus knows it. And so Jesus wrestles. In this moment, we get a glimpse of what Jesus is going through. He is there in Gethsemane. Gethsemane means the pressing place. This was a place where olives are squeezed and pressed to produce olive oil. The weight of the decision is pressing heavily upon Jesus, forcing out the life-giving goodness, but crushing him in the process. The pressure is not only internal, Luke explains how the pressure of the situation is causing Jesus to sweat, but to sweat so intensely that droplets of blood begin to form on his head. It was during World War I, as troops prepared to get out of their trenches and march towards their enemy, that they too sweated blood. The pressure of the situation was so intense. In this moment, as he prays, Jesus knows what lies in store. Jesus understands the pain he will suffer if he goes through with this. He knows what happens at a crucifixion. Everyone does. He knows the pain he will endure, the beating he will receive, the nails through his hands, the spear in his side. And so he wrestles. But Jesus also knows the emotional pain that he will have to endure. He knows that one of his closest friends will betray him. He knows that even after three years of following him, his disciples won't stand by him. He knows that even Peter will deny having anything to do with him. And so he wrestles. Jesus understands that more than the physical and emotional torture, that he will also be separated from the Father, his Father. The Trinity will be torn apart as Jesus takes upon himself the sin of the world. Jesus feels his humanity as grief engulfs him, and so he wrestles. And as he wrestles, as his soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, as he faces this cup of suffering, his closest friends sleep. Why are you sleeping? He asks. Not just once or twice, but three times. Three times as Jesus looks death in the face, his closest friends can't keep 
watch. Jesus is all alone, wrestling with the biggest decision in human history. But amidst the darkness and the loneliness, there is light as Jesus prays this prayer. Not my will be done, but yours. In this time of wrestling, in this time of prayer, Jesus finds strength. The Father strengthens him. The wrestling is over. The decision is made. Not my will be done, but yours. Jesus has chosen to go to the cross. What would happen if we prayed that prayer? What would happen if we made that prayer a guide for our lives? How could this prayer impact our community, our friends, and even our families? What would happen if we made our choices not based on our own personal agendas, but based upon God's will? I think things would be very different I don't think it will take long for people to begin to wonder, to ask questions, and to change. But this is a tough prayer to pray. It requires wrestling with the implications. It means saying, no longer my dreams, but God's dreams. No longer my money, but God's money. No longer my will, but God's will. Too often we think, that following Jesus is easy. But following Jesus is not easy. Following Jesus means sacrifice. Following Jesus is costly. Following Jesus is about surrendering everything that you have in pursuit of God's plan for your life. Not my will, but yours. This is often a painful prayer and can leave us feeling lonely, but it's also a prayer of victory. As Jesus prepares to get arrested, he says to his disciples, rise, let us go. He isn't just asking them to stand up. This is an ancient battle cry. Jesus is going into battle. He is going to the cross. He's going to enter a fight that he knows he will win. Remember Jesus in the garden, wrestling with the decision, struggling in the moment. This is the place his wrestling takes him to. Not my will be done, but yours. These words are the sign that he is ready to leave the garden. Our greatest victories often flow from our hardest decisions. It was true for Jesus. Will the same be said of us?